Good afternoon. Good afternoon from Brussels, here and online. You're actually in a hybrid event now, so we have a limited number of VIP guests present here. Thank you. And there are many of you watching online and uh, in this webinar. Welcome in the Hermann Terling building. We want to thank our host, the Flemish, gov uh, the Flemish government, Het Facilitaire Bedrijf, uh, for hosting us. And we want to thank you at home or in the office uh, for joining us from all European regions because we have participants from Denmark, Germany, the UK, uh, the Netherlands, and of course, Belgium. That's actually one small advantage from this Corona COVID period that we can actually join in large numbers. And that's why this webinar is in English. Um, so for the people entering the webinar, we are counting on you to participate and make sure that we have a lively discussion afterward. Uh, but I will get back to that later um, because we have some introductions, of course. Um, my name is Marianne van der Zanden. <laughs> I'm a brand manager for Cubic Wall Systems. Uh, we do partitions, partitions, uh, fireproof, smokeproof, doors, walls. Uh, and we are one of the partners of this Cradle to Cradle Cafe platform. Uh, which was already founded in 2011 and all partners that joined the platform produced their products in a, uh, according to the cradle to cradle principles. Also here present is uh, Arendt, the company uh, international leader in office furniture, I must say, represented by Carlijn Jonkers and her Belgium colleagues. Um, our uh, person holding the mic for the people here is Peter Derksen. Uh, he's representing Tarket, world leader in innovative flooring, sustainable and people friendly. Um, and last but not least, uh, Johanna and Mark are here from Moza. Moza is the Dutch tile manufacturer, also active internationally with great passion for ceramics. Um, but that's the way we introduce ourselves. Now we're going to do some introductions for uh, the program and the speakers. Um, before, I must say, um, Mark is operating the chat. Uh, so he will answer your uh, questions in a, uh, um, uh, directly in the chat. He will also post the questions uh, via the mic. So when you hear your voice and you hear your question, that's Mark. Um, what's important is that you're f if you're distracted or uh, should you want to watch something back or miss the slide, uh, we will integrally put this webinar on our YouTube channel. We'll show a picture later, but uh, you can always look back and are invited to do so because uh, we have a uh, very interesting program today. Um, on behalf of the organization, a few points. Um, please check our website. We have two events coming up in, um, in the Netherlands, uh, also hybrid, so with VIPs and webinar style. Uh, in Eindhoven on Tuesday, 19th of October, we do a cafe on hospitality uh, at the Domus Dela, the prize-winning building, also a prize-winning building <laughs> in Eindhoven. Um, and we will be on Maastricht in Tapijn on the 23rd of November for health and well-being. So subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on LinkedIn, uh, so you can keep track on the latest updates and register, of course. This afternoon, back to this afternoon. Um, we will present and want to debate with you on the latest sustainable product projects in this beautiful, vibrant Belgium city. Flemish city, Belgium city, French, Flemish. You must tell me about it, Mr. Gates. <laughs> um, um, we hope, even if you're in your desk or in your office uh, or in your home office, that you will get a glimpse of this new, of these new projects here in Brussels, so you can 
at least enjoy what you see on the slides. Uh, and there will also be a short movie of the Gamma team, so hang in there. Um, today's subject will bring us um, uh, um, more on uh, how the Flemish government wants to be a trendsetter in circularity. Uh, it aims for 2030 to realize their goals instead of 2050. Um, and being a good keeper, it aims to guide the total estate patrimony towards a sustainable future. And we had a discussion just now, it's all about just moving, reusing, refurbishing instead of buying new stuff. But if you buy new stuff, do it cradle to cradle proof, please. Um, It's interesting from a point of view from the client, uh, the Flemish government in this case, but we also will have the sustainable future for um, existing and new build commercial projects. So our second speaker is a developer and will give his vision about how to go about doing uh, commercial development in a, in, a, in, a, in a building that's already there and is being transformed for a new function. And we are also curious in what way uh, those clients, these clients, who will commission their architects, um, <laughs> their architects in a way that they can uh, define and realize these sustainable goals together and how they uh, um, um, move their obstacle out of the way to get these sustainable buildings realized. So, a journey along outstanding circular products will bring us to this debate, um, a short debate, that concludes this webinar and we hope we can change, exchange ideas about how to go about and how to uh, make this world a bit better together. Uh, that brings me to the introduction of our first speaker, Mr. Frank Geets. Frank is the Administrator General of Het Facilitair Bedrijf van de Vlaamse Overheid, the Agency for Facility Operations in the Flemish Government, of the Flemish Government. And amongst others, this agency has been the client for the building we are now in, in this webinar, Helmand Erling. So, thank you again. Um, but Frank will also show us Office 2023 in the uh, ZIN project, uh, which is actually being realized um, at this moment. Uh, after Frank, uh, before you get the word, Frank, uh, we will go to Peter, uh, discuss Gaia Maritime and some other good news, I hope. <laughs> and then Michiel will uh, take, us, take us through his uh, ideas as an architect for both Herman Terling, Ga Maritime, um, and perhaps even a third project. So, Frank, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, what do we do and where we go for? As Facilitaire Bedrijf, the Agency for Facility Operations, we take care of almost everything a civil servant needs to do his job. And it can be on the real estate side, on the facility management side. Uh, we have our procurement uh, affiliate and we do also information management. So everything what the civil servant needs to do his job, we take care of, he doesn't need to bother. And we do that in a sustainable and inspi inspiring way, not forgetting efficiency and professionalism, because sometimes the government it doesn't need to be efficient, etc. We take very pride that we are a very efficient and professional organization. And yes, we want to create a sustainable and inspiring work environment so that our colleagues can excel in whatever they do. And building together the government of the future is a very nice brand name for us because we're not only building, but we're also really building. Now, um, sustainable development goals, I think you, you know them, or all of you are familiar with it. And then when you, when you look into that, everything we do in this agency always starts from one or the other SDG. Because instead of saying we do a lot of things and we attach some SDGs with it, we do the reverse thing. We say, what are we going to do for each individual SDG? And then, of course, if you look at some of them, yeah, it goes about circular, fully accessible, innovation, 
um, reuse of materials, close the cycles, etc. You have the nine and the 12, but we also take care of the other ones because we want to go to a zero waste building. We want to re recycle the water. We, we want to do something about food waste, etc. So these SDGs for us are the inspiration in all the things we do. Now, uh, we are very proud that after being an SDG pioneer, and that's nothing else than saying we're interested, we want to do it, we want to learn. In 2020, we became the first SDG champion here in this country, which means that uh, we are now in a kind of transition period. We're still not yet there where we want to be at the end, but we are growing towards that. And our goal is to become next year or maybe the year after, because COVID sometimes uh, makes things a little bit more difficult. We want to become the first SEG ambassador in this country. And that's the reason why I'm going to talk in a lot of different seminars, etc., because we really want to spread the word what these SDGs can mean for your operations. And we do it in everything we do, because if we make contracts to buy clothing for road workers, we don't want that they are fabricated by children. So again, it's an SDG. If we buy fish for our cafeteria, we want to make sure that it's an, uh, a sustainable breed. So we are not going to sell anything which is not safe, which is not environmentally friendly. Now, I think most of you will know what it is. Uh, sustainability, we go around to the five Ps uh, because Besides people, planet prosperity, I think also peace, but also partnership is very important because we can't do it by ourselves and we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time again. Now, circularity, and this for me is what it all says. We used to have a linear economy. We bought things, we used them, and then we throw them away. Then we said, maybe we can recycle them, but recycling still costs you a lot of energy, a lot of effort, and a lot of euros because you're downsizing the quality of a product. So we need to go to that circular economy, not only in circular building, closing the material loops, uh, but we really need to go to what we call systems thinking. We need, don't need to say, what are we going to do with that glass? What are we going to do with that? We really need to take a very holistic approach in that. And when we then go further, we will no longer buy stuff which isn't cradle to cradle. If we make a new building, every new material will have to be certified, unless it's really, really, really not possible. But we will make a lot of partnerships to develop new products or to adapt products to a cradle to cradle uh, system. We call it perfect circularity, it doesn't yet exist. It's a goal in the future. But if we look at our Zin project, we already reach more than 97%. So we're not so far away from it. So our circular approach is that we said in our mission, we want to be the most circular facility service provider in France, in Flanders, sorry. Um, and we, we started doing that and, and focusing on those things where we have the biggest impact. Uh, where we as a government, by investing things or being the showcase, we can change eventually the market. We close cycles, but we also spend a lot of time in actively communicating about this because we want to inspire not only our colleagues, but also everybody else who is going to do some projects or some contracts or whatever. And we've already seen that in certain areas that we created new business models. Um, an example of it is we all recycle paper. You put it all together in a big bin and you recycle it and you make cardboard of it. We now recycle separately the white copy paper. We put it in a separate bin. It's being picked up by a company who it goes straight to the paper mill and they make again copy paper of it, white copy paper. So we close the loop because we're still printing sometimes, but all the paper we print will go back to the mill and will become copy paper, not cardboard. It's new. Uh, if we look at concrete, and I will give you the example further on, we now have circular concrete. In the Zin project, all the concrete we, we had on the old building and we couldn't use anymore, it was transported a few kilometers away from here where it was broken into little pieces. And then it came back 
to uh, a plant not so far away from here, about a kilometer, and there they make new concrete of it. Instead of having new granules, we used the material, really urban mining. We used the material of the building we were demolitioning, and we used it on the same site. Now, we are not really doing a demolition of the building. We are rather doing um, a decomposition of the building, but more about that later on. Uh, and so our focus is there, for instance, refurbishment of furniture. We say if we need furniture, we first we move the furniture like it is. If, we, if it needs to be repaired or refurbished, we will do that. If we can use that furniture in another way, like a desk which can't move up and down, we'll use as a table somewhere in a cafeteria. And only in last instance, we'll buy new. And if we buy new, it needs to be cradle to cradle certified. In every public procurement contract we make, we need to build in the circularity. That's the goal. We need to have 100% circular uh, contracts. Water, catering, I already talked about it. Waste, we are now doing selective collecting, but that is not the end phase. The end phase will be that in our next building, it will be a zero waste building, which means that we will have no waste. And for instance, that the waste of the kitchen will be transformed into a gas, which we will use to produce our own electricity. So we want to really not having anything leaving the building anymore, which means that maybe a can of Coca-Cola will no longer be tolerated in our building because it creates waste. And so are a lot of things we need to think about. Energy, we need to strive for CO2 neutrality. And of course, we have a lot of pioneering projects and I'm very happy that as a government, I'm allowed to do that. So I'm allowed by our uh, ministers to say, well, try it. We need to go forward here in this country so you can do experiments. You're in the Herman Teiling building. We're now here for almost five years. A nice picture of it. Uh, and this is one of the projects we did, uh, uh, circular, uh, furniture, uh, circular paper, we already uh, discussed about it. So even from desks, we make walls or vice versa. So we really try to see that old furniture, which can no longer be used as furniture, that we still use it as a material, uh, as a where you can build other things with. Now, the Herman Terling building was the biggest passive office building at this time. When we came in here, this was really the example. And then the question is, of course, what are we going to do? Are we going to make a copy of this building or are we going to try to go further than this? And then we said, well, let's try and we'll see whether the market will jump on it or not. And we were lucky. We found somebody who wanted to go the whole way with us. And on top of that, you see the very old building, which was two towers on top of uh, a five story building. We uh, deconstructed it in 2020. And by 2023, it will look like this. And some call it a zebra building. I call it the lasagna building, which means that it's no longer a monofunctional building like this building. This is an office building. It will be a polyfunctional building, we call it. On the right, you will have a hotel, but only on the first, third, fifth, seventh, etc. floor. And in between, there will be offices. The same on the other side, that will be apartments, which means that the building will always be in use, but in different ways during the day, during the week. The reason for that is that the building which came in between has a double height of the, uh, of the office. So on an office floor, it will be a big floor, but the middle will be much higher than the two sides. And in between these sides, you have then the hotel or the, the apartment. The advantage for that will be that you create a big ensemble, let's, let's call it, where we can find a lot of services. One of the things, for instance, is we have um, things uh, like uh, geothermic energy, the heat coming we use that during the day in the office, but in the evening and in the weekends, we will use it for the apartments and the hotel. 
The same goes for the water we are recycling. The same will be for the electricity we're gaining with solar panels, panels or um, by a, a gas turbine. So we'll use this throughout the whole building. It will become one unity, and which means that you don't always have to have these peaks because the peak of a hotel will be on a different time than the peak of an apartment or the peak in an office building. So we can use that. And there are quite some films you can see on, um, on the right where you can look at uh, nice pictures, nice little films about it. But the advantage of this kind of building is that it allows us to, um, to play a little bit with new things. Like in Belgium, you cannot share electricity amongst other occupants. You, you need to have, each one of them needs to be a customer of the electricity company. We made it one system with one owner, so you can share it. So there are a lot of legal obligations we have to fulfill, a lot of technical obligations, but we are willing to go that way and to spend some time and money on it to make maybe a first or a second or a third time it is being uh, used here, uh, here in Belgium. And then when we do these buildings, of course, we, uh, I think all of you know Totem, the material passports. Everybody is now making his, his models in BIM. Uh, we developed our own, uh, I wouldn't call it Bleambic because it's much better, but Gro is our means of um, uh, quality, of circularity, sustainability where we take into account a lot of elements of a building, even during the building process, it's all not taken into account to give you some, the gold, silver, uh, bronze system, as you know. Then, of course, when we uh, went to circularity, we said, well, we need to do much more. And then we say, well, we want a second life, we want a third life, we want a building that whenever we leave the office, that you can still use the building for something else. We want to have a circular construction concept, material use, which you find local, and energy neutrality. One of the things we found, for instance, is that there was quite some uh, carpet tiles there in the old building, which were still good usable. We didn't throw them away. We didn't even recycle them. We reused them in another office building. Uh, the raised floors, the insulation, uh, metal plating, etc., etc., will be reused in the new building. So about two, one half of the new building will consist of things which were already there. It's, it's a lot of concrete, the parkings, etc. And then there will be about 10%, 15% of things which were taken away but brought back and get a second life in the building as they are. All the other things which we need to have new, they have to be cradle to cradle, and we reach 97% cradle to cradle. Of course, some people say, well, circularity, it's not a circular building because you don't know what in 1972 was in the concrete. Because it's 50 years ago, the concrete is still there. We don't know exactly what is in that concrete. But we believe that if you don't demolition it, it's better than to demolish it and put a complete new building with cradle to cradle concrete. No, it's better to, to keep the 50% of the concrete, which is still there in the state as it is. Okay? We don't have a material passport, but we can live with it. <coughs> and that's about the end of my presentation. Wow. So circularity, uh, it's of course a concept we need to do on the level of the neighborhood, of the, of the site of it. You can't do it just in a very single building. The material flows, we actively did urban mining because a lot of materials which we cannot reuse in the new building will be sold, will be reused as secondhand material. The flows, we have water coming from above, water coming from beneath and water coming out of the showers, etc. We all get that together. We filter it, we clean it, and then with that water, we can have about 60% of the sanitation water of that building. With energy, we are reaching a 70% level of self-supporting. Uh, and of course, we have a big um, number of plants in the building, but we also have a big setter 
in, in, in front of it where we can have uh, a really green climate in the building. And then, of course, when you, when you do that, you, you need to have an idea of what it is. Uh, I already talked about insulation, the raised floors, the, the furniture which will be uh, sold. So we first try to preserve, then we try to reuse, and only at the end we recycle. So we call it selective demolition. It takes much more time, it costs more money, but at the end of the day, it gives you a cheaper building. So that's what we said, you need to get a system thinking of it and look at the whole broad picture. And then I know I'm in a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So th this is a cycle um, of the circular materials, but I think you all will already have uh, saw it. And for us, what's important, that we stimulate the market, that we make the market aware that there is a demand for it and that we try to change the market. Uh, I gave you the, the example of the concrete, uh, where we got the first Benelux uh, concrete uh, cradle to cradle with a silver uh, star. Uh, and we will not only use it on the side, but we also will use it on all the prefab elements. And then, of course, we know that there is climate change. Uh, whatever we did in Zin will again be outdated by the time for 2030 we go to a new building. We always have to go further and further. And I think it's a moral obligation, especially from a government. And of course, with the COVID crisis, the hybrid working, also the need for buildings will go down. But when we need a building, it will always have to be a better and better building. But we are ready for that. Thank you. That's a great way to end. <laughs> Wellicht zijn er nog een paar vragen, meneer Heets. Momentje alstublieft. Questions. Uh, we have time for one or two really burning questions. I think, uh, Peter, Carlijn, I want to pose a question. Um, I was inspired by what you said about uh, tackling the, you said you wanted to be the most circular service provider in uh, Vlaanderen by focusing on elements that have the biggest impact. You talked a lot about concrete. Maybe that was your first big Mm -hmm. rock. Uh, I was wondering what's the next one you will over win and what challenges are you uh, thinking there, will there be facing? There is no next one, there is a very big group of next ones. Because it's, it's not only when you see the wood here, uh, this wood also has to be cradle to cradle certified. We are not going to cut trees in the Amazon to, to have all the products we are using. Uh, for instance, if you go to a circular building, you will not use silicones anymore. Uh, you will bolt things together instead of gluing things together. So it's every element we have in that building. We created 36 products, cradle to cradle, which didn't exist before. So it's not only the big thing like concrete, which is three quarters of the mass of a building, if you look at in tons, but it's also all the other things we needed. It's, it's like uh, the garment of the seat. It all has to fulfill that cradle to cradle coffee. Uh, makes me wonder, Frank, if you say, if you say try it, try it, what went wrong? But perhaps that's something for later on. That's for later <laughs> on, because we're still doing it. <laughs> I mean, something cannot go wrong. It can be improved, of course. But what went wrong? That's also a question yeah. I would... Uh, but um. let's, keep, let's save that one okay. for later on. Because it's time for the next speaker. And our next speaker is uh, Peter de Durpel. Um, which is the developer of uh, Gaia Maritime representing Extensa, of course. Um, they commissioned uh, Michiel Riedijk. Um, it's a remarkable project. It's a prize-winning project. Peter, we prepared this while you were in Cannes, picking up your beautiful award there. There was an architecture award from the Netherlands last year. There are multiple awards. And... Um, Today, even the Realty Summit uh, is happening in Gaia Maritime today and tomorrow. So um, there's a lot of attention and a lot of uh, compliments, perhaps even from your branch. So uh, would you care to uh, uh, take the stand and perhaps share your good news with us as well? Because there's more good news. It's yours. Here's the... Thank you. Is this work? Yes. Good afternoon. 
First of all, some breaking news. Since yesterday, we are not extensa anymore, but Nextensa. Nextensa, as we have uh, made a business uh, combination with LeaseInvest, LeaseInvest, a uh, real estate investor, um, Extensa real estate developer, we joined forces, and now from now on, we will go uh, together with the name Nextensa. So we are preserving, reusing, and adding just a little n. We, we, we would not like to throw away the, the, the name of Extensa, which exists over more than 110 years. It was uh, formed at that time for the extension of the city of Antwerp. The name comes from Extension et Entreprise en Versoise. At that time, it was in French. <laughs> um, but we wanted to to reuse that name because it stands for the same principles today, the extension of the city. But today, unless we have a lot of land still, we don't exploit it anymore. We are now focusing on the cities. ESG driven because we are a sustainable development goal. The main focus is creating sustainable cities and communities. So the social aspect is, of course, also uh, an important one. And there we have to be, first of all, we want to, to put the bar very high as a USP in the market. We, of course, we also want to be, to be challenged. And we have been challenged in this building by the uh, Flemish authorities. And that's quite a, a challenge. We learned a lot about uh, it and I will come to that later on uh, for when I talk about the sense and nonsense of certification. The local standards have also their importance and the bar was already high. Uh, secondly, the importance of scale. We're focusing now on two cities, the extension of Luxembourg and Brussels with tour and taxis. We want to create here a new community with about 1,600, at the long term, of course, 1,600 uh, units, apartments, uh, offices, part of it retail, and of course, uh, from which the uh, Tour and Taxi has known the events, and to create a low car site. You have here uh, a view on what, how it will look like within one year, because next week we are starting to create the, the ponds in the middle of uh, the site, because it's not only about buildings, it's also the infrastructure which has its importance, the landscaping, the total area of the park is about nine hectares, and that is also, of course, the compensation of the more dense areas, as you can see at the right-hand side. So, driven by ESG and a focus on reusing buildings, structures. As Frank already said, where you can, we have to, we have to avoid demolishing. And I heard the minister this morning at the real estate fair, also the Brussels authorities will have a more severe look on the new projects just to, to avoid that too easy, we're demolishing buildings and then with a lot of sustainable source, <laughs> I would say, build uh, new structures. Of course, and I know this is an atypical uh, site with all those heritage buildings, but it has also its complexity because responding to the new standards with regard to energy materials, that's the most complex uh, thing. The first one we have reno renovated was the one you, you see below. These are off still our offices in 2003. And the next one was the event space. And now I would like to say a word about the Gare Maritime. But what is important is that we have to, um, be, to consider the time needed to develop in real estate, we need a lot of time. So we have to challenge each other, and that's what, what we have seen here also. For one building, it easily takes six, seven years. The competition for this building was 2011, has been delivered in 2017. When you talk about the whole site, we're talking about 20 years. We bought the site in, in 2000, um, 
and we haven't finished yet. So it takes time. So we have to da dare to set very ambitious goals because technology goes fast, society goes fast, and the environmental assessment methods become always more severe. So it's not wrong to set very high ambitions and then in the meantime you, can, you have to be agile and, and flexible. But if you don't do that, the, once you deliver, you're already too late. So the complexity with the heritage buildings is of course, first of all, uh, with regard to energy. Uh, a good example for that one is the, the Gar Maritime. And we have the ambition with Turin Taxis to be as independent as possible from the electricity and gas uh, distribution. This building, the, the building next to it from the Brussels Environmental Services, they both work on geothermal energy, Gar Maritime as well. There we go to about 150 meters uh, depth, but there is no gas entering the complex. Two major aspects, first of all, authenticity. So we have decided within the group not to demolish any building, even the, the smallest one in the park, we will not demolish it, but we have to think about reusing it. That's the first important uh, thing, just to avoid uh, CO2. F secondly, the social aspect, inclusiveness. This means that we have to attract as much as possible, and that's a very difficult um, uh, exercise for this area, to bring also the people from the neighborhood within in, to use the park, etc but not an evident one. With regard to the buildings uh, themselves, we have also set the ambition that for the next three developments, the second one will start within two months, to put, also, to put it also on geothermal energy. In total for the whole site, we produce about 4,000 megawatt hours electricity with uh, Herman Terling, with the Gare Maritime, the, the the most, the largest, uh, let's say, sun uh, installation in the Brussels uh, region. Uh, in total, 4,000 megawatt hour. Um, but the, the problem is how to deal with it when there is an overflow. And that's why we have decided uh, recently to create an energy community. Because there, I think, the authorities will, will need to give us more flexibility about that. And that's one of the uh, possibilities when there is an overflow we can use it for for instance the more social apartments so that's one thing and therefore you need scale so i'm a fan of large-scale projects because then you have of course much more uh, you can set the ambitious higher with regard to electricity but also with regard to for instance water this building hasn't been uh, connected because all water has been reused, buffered. But for the whole site, we have decided, and it's an investment, to create under the uh, Avenue du Port, the Havelaan, to create a direct connection to the canal. Because we don't want that, of course, first of all, we reuse the water, then we buffer it. But if there is an overflow, not to put it into the... Into the... Into the... So because in Brussels, malheureusement, we still mix wastewater and rainwater. So we don't want our rainwater to be purified in the installations because we all pay for it. Not only for that reason, but as a principle, our rainwater goes directly into the canal with the collaboration of the port of Brussels. What are those measures that we have implemented in the Gar Maritime? As you know, or maybe not, the Gare Maritime was the biggest uh, freight station uh, in the beginning 20th century. All those buildings have been built uh, between 1900 and 1910. And the challenge was the building was too big. It's about 280 meters by 140 meters. So uh, it's about four hectares. But one day we had a small plan from the architecture office, Netling Sridek, and we said, yes, that is, that is the plan that we will execute because it respects the building and we can reuse it almost completely. But 
we added some extra measurements with regard to sustainability. First of all, we, the new constructions within the Gare Maritime are all built in wood, about 10,000 uh, cubic met meters to avoid about 3,500 tons of CO2. We learned a lot about that because the construction process was more a logistic process. We avoided failure costs, and I know it's an atypical one because the roof was already uh, there, but it had also an impact on the waste management. The speed of construction, we, uh, Michiel will, will tell us about the, the different volumes, about 10 volumes have been created into the station. Each volume took about eight to 10 weeks only to build it completely safer and uh, quicker. We also built in about 10 gardens, 3,000 square me meters indoor gardens. Maybe that's a little bit not natural, but we, we used the rainwater from, of course, that immense uh, roof to have drainage for, the, for the, the 10 gardens. As I told you before, about 140 meters depth geothermal energy, so there is no gas uh, entering it. Transport as much as possible by uh, the water using the canal. And last but not least, 17,000 square meters of photovoltaic panels on the high roofs, which allows us to produce about 3,000 megawatt hours per year, uh, representing a approximately the consumption of uh, 850 households. With regard to our vision and why do we do this, first of all, it's a USP, yes, but also our tenants, they force us to do so because they have also their sustainable development goals and they ask us for our building, what is the consumption, how much of the energy is green, is locally produced, and the third reason, of course, our reference shareholder, uh, which is the holding Ackermans van Aarden, also forces us to go as far as possible because they are also, uh, they have also their evaluation. The new taxonometry is a new vocabulary for every uh, big company. Here you see some images of those, uh, first of all, the reuse of the water. So uh, with the diameter of about two, um, two meters, we put those uh, long tubes about 300, uh, 280 meters long to harvest about uh, 1.4 uh, uh, million uh, liters. Reusing the structure, of course, with the new legislation, uh, the legislation of today with regard to fire protection, is not that evident. Uh, it took us a lot of uh, evidence and, and explanations to because this is considered by the fire brigade as one big building uh, to, to have everything regulated. That's why it's also completely sprinklered. Here you have some uh, views of the different modules, so completely built in wood. As you said, uh, well recognized nationally and internationally, there is someone in our company who is gathering uh, awards for this one. <laughs> We're proud of it. The next step uh, we will, um, this is also a, a first preview, I haven't shown it before. It will open by the end of October. Why I'm showing you this, we will integrate uh, a food market in it we, because we want people to get out of their offices and also to come together at, at noon and in the evening. And to f for the facilities of this, we also want higher ambitions. We have chosen Abbey InBev as operator, and I think we can learn a lot of the, the, Flemish community, the Flemish authorities for that one, because that is not our specialty, but we want, by quality assessment, be sure that also the waste management, the, ma the maintenance, the use of the products uh, is in line with our sustainable ambitions uh, within the Gare Maritime. So to review, first of all, the importance of scale. I think, um, I know, <laughs> that's why I'm trying to conclude with this one. Um, the importance of scale, I've given the uh, example for water, energy, uh, community, etc. It's not easy and uh, I hope that authorities will not, first of all, split different areas to bring it to the market, but to, to allow that development of scale. 
The impact of recycling complete structures, of course, if not uh, necessary, do not demolish. Uh, the importance of off-site construction goes very much safer and quicker. Um, the increased impact of materials, of course, in this case it was the, the massive use of wood. The sense and, non and nonsense of certification, uh, there, um, if those instruments like Bream in Luxembourg, we use DGNB, um, they have, of course, they sense also the local uh, handbooks, but it has to be used as an instrument, not a tick the box afterwards. Why do we use the international standards? Because the investors ask for it. It's, it's Bream uh, in Belgium and it's and well for the comfort, where Luxembourg is more oriented uh, to the German DGNB. ESG as a main, as a common driver, as I told you, the tenants ask us, give us the figures about energy consumption locally produced, etc. And if all those boxes have been ticked, then of course the, there is also the value for the our own as an investor or, or maybe other investors uh, because it will be rented much quicker. May not at a higher price. The market determines the price, but much quicker. We have the example in the heart of Brussels now in the Rue Montoyer, the Montoyer Strat, uh, where very quickly we build there an office also in wood that there is an interest directly to have that building rented. I'll give you a small overview of the buildings of Tour and Taxi and I thank you for your attention. Yes, yes, we are live again. Um, there are no questions yet for Peter, but we have some nice debate issues that we can discuss later on in the minutes at rest, because it's actually time to thank you, to uh, give the floor to our third speaker, uh, which is, I had a quick look, Michiel, but it's really going to be mastering the slides there. So uh, you want to, <laughs> there are lots of slides for the third speaker. But Rotterdam based, Neutelings Riedijk Architects, you're working in a lot of um, uh, major, on, 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 on major projects here in Brussels. Um, we've seen Ga Maritime, we've seen Herman Terling from the client perspective. Uh, but now the architect will uh, uh, give us the, the, the projects from his side. 
And we also have a little scoop in a way because um, uh, there's news about the third project here in Brussels that Michiel is working on. So um, Michiel, if I can invite you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to start something with something completely different. However, it is of a paramount importance to understand what I would like to say. And basically, it also relates to what Frank Geets and Peter de Durpel have been talking about. Currently, we are facing a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift, as, as coined by the Nobel Prize winner Paul Crutzen, is the fact that we have to accept that we are in the entering into the Anthropocene era, the era where mankind profoundly influences the way our biosphere is shaped, both in a positive and in a negative sense. Let's say the biosphere as we have known it is not the biosphere as we have so far been defining it as the Holocene. All actions, regardless whether we are commissioning a building, like Peter has been doing twice for our office, like Frank Geitz has been doing vis-a-vis -vis his relation with Nextenza, regardless whether you're commissioning a building or designing a building, the fact that we are into the Anthropocene era has profound consequences. And we as an office are still, let's say, trying to internalize that and trying to understand what the consequences of this paradigm shift might be. Sustainability as such is a very long or has a very long uh, relation uh, and is very long part of the thinking within our office. One of the first and maybe one of the most emblematic sustainable buildings uh, we have been designing in the 90s was the Minard building for the University of Utrecht. And it was a um, building that uh, entitled or was commissioned for all physics and departments of the University of Utrecht. And what we were aiming at at that time is that we would make a building that was in a way appealing to all five senses. A building that you literally would feel the water pouring into the building, that the water, the rainwater collected in the heart of the building would um, cool the laboratory spaces below, that you would smell the vapor of the water while crossing the main space, that you would allow all the five senses being um, stimulated and in such a way would, use, would be used in order to make a highly sustainable environment. This was 25 years ago and when we started designing this, this was almost uh, 30 years ago, and we always were searching for a relation between uh, sustainability and the way the haptic and tactile qualities of, of architecture could find a synthesis between sustainability goals and the way you would shape your environment. For us, the Minard building, and this is a, a quite a dark um, image of the central hall, the Minard building comprised in that, in that sense a first step into a research that eventually culminated in the Hermann Terling building and in uh, the, the Gare Maritime and the Isala building we're doing along the Wetstraat. Because the rainwater collected in the central pond, the fact that the main spaces in this central space were not heated, but were in a way gaining um, and, and enjoying the temperature differences of the outside temperature and simultaneously while doing so, uh, creating in a way an insulation between the outside space and the insulated spaces that are in the base of the building. 
formed for us a kind of uh, fundamental step in rethinking what architecture could do. So from that on, it's in our thinking a relatively small step towards the Hermann Terling building, the building we are in right now. The building comprises the main headquarters of the Flemish government in Brussels. But again, what is key in this building that it's um, uh, again a balance between large inside pockets, accommodating green, accommodating lush nature in the heart of an office space, simultaneously surrounded by insulated office spaces as well. So besides, of course, the aspects Peter and Frank were already referring to, reaching a sustainability goal, reaching a high quality office standard, we think that an office of this size and importance should provide an extension of the public domain. Since besides the technical performances of a building, indeed complying to the highest sustainability standards, uh, the building should in a way contribute to the quality of the adjacent urban domain. The reason why I'm showing this rather difficult slide is that you have to imagine, as you might recall the movie just, just shown by Peter, is that we have in front of our building, we have the uh, famous uh, Entrepôt Royal, and within the heart of the Entrepôt Royal, there's a longitudinal street that stretches all over the long axis of the building. The interesting thing is that with this building for the Flemish government, we try to mirror that and we try to create a large public domain in the heart of this building on the ground floor that opens up to different functions like the restaurant, like the auditorium spaces here, but that also enables you to enter into three different cores and the core also of uh, uh, the tower that is on the far end of this building. And by doing so, we also created a kind of future robustness because currently, of course, the building comprises the Flemish government. But it might be that in future, uh, let's say 10, 20 years, the building has to accommodate other tenants. And by having the course stretched along this inner street, we were able to uh, propose to both Extensa and the Flemish government a building with a future robustness that relates to the quality of the city and also relates to the quality of the neighborhood that surrounds us. So besides, of course, coming to kind of excellent technical performance, we would like to argue, as we already sh have shown in the Minard building and as we are also showing in this building and in the Gare Maritime, that prolonging the urban development, prolonging the qualities of the neighborhood, offering inner gardens, offering inner streets, is simultaneously part of a kind of integral sustainability thinking that all buildings should offer, according to us. I won't recall the slides already shown by Frank Geets, but what is important, of course, is that this inner quality and that this passage, let's say, stretches from light pocket to light pocket and in a way forms a, a sequence of uh, architectural events that tie together the different elements within this building. <laughs> After Peter and Frank, it's rather difficult to explain this again. So hopefully you, you will study this, but basically, of course, this building offers an excellent performance in terms of su sustainability. It was, according to the Flemish star system, uh, an excellent passive building at the time that we have delivered it. Of course, technology progresses, time progresses, both Peter and Frank were referring to the fact that we should lift the bar. Uh, we still think that the technical performance of this building in compliance with the green and the public nature of the base 
still offers, in our case, a reference and a, um, a paradigm shift in the way we perceive architecture um, for such a large office venue. Related to that, and if you might have walked around it, you could have seen a poem by Charlotte von der Broek uh, installed in the, in the building. We think that it is of paramount importance that within the building of such a uh, magnitude and, and size and performance, art pieces should, shall or should be integrated in such a way that they contribute to the identity of this place and of this building. The Gare Maritime. <laughs> uh, of course, a lot of things have been said, so I will try to tell you something that you do not know yet. Indeed, it was a very large freight station, uh, and it consists, in fact, out of seven long longitudinal holes, three high holes, four lower holes adjacent to that, and basically, um, like Peter de Durpel already just explained, the main strategy of the sketch we've provided to, to Extensa is that we proposed to have a kind of radical division of open and closed spaces. By proposing 10 new blocks in the side base of these seven holes, and two smaller blocks at the far end uh, along the Picardstraat, we were able to develop an, a beautiful covered city where it never rains. And we've provided a long covered Rambla, so to speak, that stretches from the Picardstraat towards uh, the park in the heart of the Gare Maritime. I will show you that on the next slide. So basically, by liberating the three middle bays, so this high middle bay and the two lower bays adjacent to that, by liberating them from a programmatic burden or a built programmatic burden, we were able to provide this large plaza which can be programmed in whatever way uh, extensa, uh, Nextenza imagines. And currently, of course, there's this large real estate fair going on. Here you see that strategy in a way summarized in this uh, section. So the two outer bays programmed with buildings and the three middle bays liberated, the two lower middle bays uh, programmed with green, whereas the, the long central bay remains this open square stretching from the Picardstraat to the park. So basically there's a kind of radical organization between what is built and what is unbuilt. And by doing so, you create a small city, a town, a town where it never rains. The 10 blocks, as said, they provide small streets, open perpendicular towards the neighborhood around, opening towards the new living quarter on the western side of the Gare Maritime, openings to opening towards the sheds, and the two very small buildings on the far end along the Picardstraat, they articulate the three lower entrance spaces that are not lower, a little bit smaller entrance spaces that delineate the entrance towards the building. As said, one of the key assets of structuring this design in a timber, full timber structure is the fact that it could be completely prefabricated. And since we're today discussing circularity, one of the paramount elements within circularity is the fact that you are able to dismantle it. And a CLT production, which is done offsite, uh, enables you to eventually dismantle uh, all the new structures added uh, recently into um, this uh, beautiful uh, heritage structure. So also, if you take into account the famous Charter of Venice, and the Charter of Venice, if you do not know that, is in a way a charter that 
demands from all designers that if you uh, interfere in a heritage building, you should always be able to reconstruct it in its original state. And the beauty of adding this uh, timber structure is that it also allows, if necessary, to reconstruct the Gare Maritime in its original state after 20, 30 years from now. And then these beautiful CLT uh, floor planks and, and walls and uh, columns can be repurposed in another building, hopefully. Of course, there are some small concrete foundational works, but you do see here the relatively elegant and expedient way of mounting the building on site. If we then look at it, let's say, what is very apparent and strong is that you see the kind of green nature that is enabled by turning into these lower side bays along the middle bay into vast green pockets. Again, since Frank Gates and Peter de Deurpel already have, uh, let's say, established the benchmark in, in, in explaining what kind of uh, sustainable performances are offered both by the Herman Terlink and uh, the Gare Maritime, I will not go into that. But what is key and which also might be a good starting point for the, the, the coming discussion uh, about, let's say, sustainable and circular development, both in Flanders and in the Brussels region, is that um, the fact that you have to design with the constraint of, in this case, the heritage of the seven large holes that are uh, reused and repurposed forces you to, to, to take a next step in, in your design effort. Peter was already referring to, to the, the fire safety constraints we were facing while uh, constructing this or while getting a, a building permit. Peter did not yet touch upon the fact that due to solar gain, the full uh, 280 meters uh, uh, cast iron structure expands in summer and shrinks, of course, in winter, expands during the 24 hour cycle of the day. So we designed it in such a way with, with our engineers that the, 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 the former steel structure can move, can shrink, can expand without being hampered or tempered or, 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 or hindered for that matter by the, the, the new uh, CLT structure added. So the fact that you have to deal with a very important constraint, which is kind of the repurposing and uh, understanding a kind of circular use of this former building also in a way drives design innovation. And let's say we are very proud to show this beautiful result and, and we think that it also provides kind of beautiful office spaces and beautiful working conditions while being here. And the interesting thing, of course, is that if you work with uh, the beauty of a timber structure, in a way, the core and shell solution uh, that you have, let's say, uh, the, the, the structure directly exposed also saves you in a way to, to finish. And let's say normally if you have a concrete wall or if you have another kind of wall, you're also almost demanded to plaster it or to, 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 to paint it. The advantage of, of let's say working with, with such a beautiful material as, as, as timber in a way also allows you to, to have a, a building where the, the structural solution immediately also uh, offers the finishing of the interior. As already told you, let's say, we can take apart all elements um, and we can disassemble if necessary. Hopefully not, we can disassemble and repurpose uh, the full building into the future. And the, the interesting thing is that it also, uh, let's say, in fact, 
offers very simple detailing that uh, allows you for um, a future use. Since I'm running out of time, I will use this as the last slide. Um, the fact that the building offers this generous public space, offers a space that is in a way without programmatic burden, I would argue that one of the most circular and sustainable solutions are in this picture. That counts for the Hermann Terling building, but it also counts for Gar Maritime. In a way, one of the constraints of architecture is that a lot of spaces are always burdened with the programmatic limitations. The interesting thing about the gardens in this building and the gardens in the Gare Maritime, that due to its size, due to its generosity, it invites everybody for a different use, but it also is robust in its kind of future development and the things it might offer to everybody in the coming future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michiel. If I can invite you to uh, sit behind the table, please. Also, Frank and Peter, you can sit over there. Um, because for the next 10 minutes, bear with us when you're at home. Post your question in the chat. Mark is waiting. Um, we uh, got triggered also here in the, in the, in the, in the public by some, um, um, well, you mentioned your tenants and you mentioned your, um, th the way they demand their, uh, um, that their surroundings, their work environment is also uh, sustainable. But in what way, in what sense are they, um, are, they, are they willing to also invest in those better buildings, in better climate, in better work conditions? Um, Peter, because, um, well, as they say, uh, sustainability can also mean more costs, more investment from your side. Uh, from our side, but we also saw that from their side, uh, with their proper finishing works, they also uh, are prepared to invest more than usual. Uh, we have some good examples with, for example, the company uh, Accenture and also um, Publicis, that they went also in the same direction using wood, using that um, that that kind of materials mm -hmm. which are not the, the cheap the cheapest yeah. one. Yeah. And what is their reason? First of all, of course, also their ESG program, but also the war for talent. They want to to follow our way uh, to attract people because mm. it's attractive place to work yeah. and uh, that was certainly the case for those two that I just named because there is a war for talent for uh, consulting for marketing and communication offices mm -hmm. and that's also a reason yeah. for them. Yeah. And does that uh, as an investor in this case and as a project developer does that also result in uh, your tenants uh, actually paying more per square meter as, as it is uh, uh, somebody so saying no now. Pay, pay more? No, no, no. no the market just is the still the location, uh, first of all, and you can yeah. force the market. But the speed off, and that has mm -hmm. also its value. Uh, we we manage now to fill the, the, the all the the office levels for about eighty two percent, and we are st under negotiation for the, the rest of it, and um, at. Uh, quite some difficult times because there is a lot of free uh, office mm -hmm. space in Brussels. Mm -hmm. So that has also its value. Yeah, time. It's very attractive, of course, to, uh, to work and play here. Yeah. Does the Flemish government also invest in a sense of uh, being the user of such a building? And, and well, I think when we, when, we have, when we go into buildings, we spend quite some money because the war of talent also is true for us. Only in Dutch, duurzaamheid hoeft niet duur te zijn. Because if we are going to have these sustainable buildings, uh, you really have to rethink it. And not saying these are additional costs, but these are costs which replace other costs which we don't need anymore. I must say we don't pay more rent 
-hmm. But on the other hand, I believe that if you don't have a sustainable building anymore, it will take you much more time to find a tenant to rent it because nowadays the, the good companies or the good, uh, the good employers, they, yeah. they want to have sustainable buildings. And also your residual value of a building will be much higher in the future. But I, let's not forget that demolishing buildings, these old these old old fashioned buildings, demolishing them will cost also a lot of money, which with this sustainable buildings, mm -hmm. you just demount them and you build them somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you look at the total picture, this kind of sustainable buildings doesn't need to be more expensive. And in any case, they will be the buildings which attract tenants, which will attract the right companies. Yeah. And yeah. maybe the other buildings will become more and more empty. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. But if you look at uh, you as a user of this building, and Michiel um, um, uh, tried to tell us about the future-proofness of a building and always being able to uh, also get a new tenant for it, uh, isn't there anything that you as Flemish government or uh, 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 office users in your building want to have to build their own brand, their own feeling, That's my. this is my work environment, that's actually opposing Michiel's idea of future proofness that every new tenant can get in. Is it, are, are your buildings more anonymous because of, uh, with regard to the future? I think they are more anonymous as what they would have been in the, in the, the very past. We will of course put our logo on it, we will do, but we are not looking something different than what the market mm -hmm. is, is, is requiring. Mm -hmm. If somebody else would come into this building, they would be able to use it without any problem. Uh, I totally agree and, and I uh, just want to add that it has to be an inspiring environment where co-creation also is uh, motivated. We have yeah. some good examples and uh, one of the other tenants is uh, the Universal uh, Music Group that, that we have and we are looking now for synergies. Uh, Bosch Siemens House created the same. How can we uh, collaborate within that the whole complex? Not They're not staying in their modules, but they see yeah. is, is there eventually synergy uh, with, our, with the other tenants and, and with us as, as, as the owner. And that's a very interesting uh, story. Sure, sure. Are there any questions in the public? Peter, would you care to hand over the mic somewhere or to yeah. put the mic in somebody's... Uh <laughs> yeah, I, I had to add something which was just mentioned by Peter and Frank. Is the fact that banks are, but also large insurance companies, are changing as we speak right now. For instance, we have the discussion on frozen assets in relation to the large uh, oil companies at this moment. What you do see happening is that um, banks demand for a very sustainable building in order to finance future buildings. And I would argue that, the, let's say, the bar raised by the Flemish government and raised by Nextenza is also influencing, in fact, um, the financial world. And as what you're seeing right now is the fact that if banks demand for a sustainable development, mm -hmm. otherwise they will not endorse you with uh, the financial assets necessary to, to eventually build the building, mm -hmm. that is quite a change. And I would argue that if all these things are gradually changing, we are really seeing a paradigm more, shift. More awareness and more yeah. shifts, yeah. But it is, it is also striking that it seems to happen on the private sector side instead of on the government side, except for, let's say, the, what <laughs> the Flemish government does. The middle, but yeah in the Brussels region at least, th for the Brussels region that does not count yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um. I was wondering, since you all three have different uh, um, uh, project approaches, uh, which might uh, also lead to conflicts, how did you uh, manage to overcome those conflicts? Or were there any conflicts at all? Maybe it was all peace and uh, heaven, it could be, but I'm wondering how did you overcome the 
uh, conflicts in the collaboration together. Or perhaps, if I may add, in collaboration with a contractor who is uh, not uh, eager to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to use the materials required and trying to... Let's say in, in both Mar Gare Maritime and in the Hermann Tengling building, we did not encounter conflicts. We, of course, have different roles in the execution process. And let's say the contractor has to deliver on time. We want the highest quality. Extensa and the Flemish government also would like to obtain the highest quality for a fixed price. So since there are very explicit roles in um, the execution process of, of a building like the Hermann Terling building, I think you, you can come to a very good result. If these roles are watered down, I would argue that you, you, might, you might end up in compromises or, or maybe even conflicts. Uh, so what is key and what we really appreciated in both the uh, Hermann Terling building and in the Garmer team is that everybody had, had his or her precise role within the development process. And by doing so, you, you, at the end of the day, you come to a, a result which benefits all parties. I think also the type of, of construction um, for this building was a more in a tr traditional uh, collaboration, but especially for Gair Maritime, we, we had a very good collaborative um, with all, all the um, contractors because the use of food forces too. <laughs> there we saw the advantage of BIM because every element has been <coughs> prefabricated and it's no question to adapt uh, according in, in the execution phase. We had to work together. Mean, in the meantime, the, the permit was running, but we worked very intensively together. And then once the permit was in, it was construction without further discussion because everything was fixed. So the type of construction forced us to collaborate in, in advance much more intensively. And that's, I think, the most important. It's not during the execution process that you have to discuss. It's too late. Um, sorry, you have to use the mic, Caroline. Did that also have a positive influence on the price? Uh, a lot of times the budget is uh, made up and then there are all these unforeseen costs. Did that help? Yes, it had, certainly. And, and for certain elements, we also discussed in an open book system because we knew that there will be there would be an impact on the waste, less waste, so less cost, and and we discussed it uh, in an open in open book. We we could estimate the impact and the contractor neither because it was new, but we we, we had the profit of both. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a question from our chat uh, guests. <coughs> One, yeah. No, yeah, that's, uh, that's right. We have a question from uh, uh, Francois Philippe. Um, he's asking uh, the circular topic related to our primary need of food, asked for using uh, the surroundings of the buildings. Uh, so carbon content of, content of food waste um, can make the environment more adaptive or resilient. A sustainable way of creating and supporting green areas, such as using compost or feminine, um, and he's asking, is that already in scope? Have you thought of that, that, that far, that uh, boost fate, um, waste food uh, will be taken in scope, uh, scope of scale? Because you mentioned the food court that is under development. Do you go then that far that you try to, uh, to circular, yeah, to, 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 to not go to get zero waste, waste out of that? Yeah. We're investigating now that, that, that <laughs> case yeah. to, because it's a huge amount of food. Uh, we, our estimation is about 1,000, 1,500 meals a day. That's a lot, and we have discussions now with uh, uh, Brussels Environment if it is allowed to have uh, on-site our own installations to reuse in the park mm -hmm. for composting. It's underway, I hope. Yep. <laughs> Self-sufficient, uh, self self-providing everything. It's a good idea. Even the not 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 uh, putting your rainwater in the sewer. It's like a principle that every building like yours should have. Huh? 
I understand what you mean. We have one last question from Doreen. And that would have to conclude the, the debates. To conclude yes. the debates. Uh, my question is whether there's a uh, difference in realizing these projects in Belgium versus the Netherlands. And if any, what difference? And do you, uh, do you want to... <laughs> 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 And even would you mind adding some tips for the other governments? Because we have a good example here, but how, how is that for the other countries, the other listeners in other countries? Let's say, let's say that your question um, relates to a lot of topics. First and foremost, let's say the Flemish government, compared to the Dutch na national government, sets higher bars than the... Dutch national government. So that's the first thing. That also counts for the Brussels region, sets higher bars than the Dutch national government. For instance, in, in, re in relation to plein terre, so full soil, uh, in almost all new projects in, in the Brussels region, you are obliged to have areas of full soil in order to enhance the biodiversity. Uh, so we have, of course, green roofs, we have green in the building. However, in order to really enforce the biodiversity, you need full soil. That is just demanded for by the Brussels region. That does not happen in the Netherlands. So honestly, let's say in the Netherlands, the bar is not that high. Uh, so if you think about the preposterous demand for bang, bijna energie neutraal, which is ridiculous. Instead <laughs> of having a full energy neutral building, new legislation demands for bijna energie neutraal. Why on earth do we come to such a compromise? So, since I have to work in the Netherlands as well, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it here. But there, there's quite some difference. But for instance, in Germany, we also have German guests in the webinar. Um, well, are there tips? Are there, are there really for architects, developers, things you would advise how to go about? Because not all countries are as far as the Flanders, uh, the Flanders government, the Flemish government, so... I think what is key is that if you take into account that we are in the Anthropocene era, it is key that everything starts with reducing energy consumption, reducing material consumption, avoiding waste. And so it starts with that. And then, of course, being energy neutral or being en energy positive or... or, or almost energy neutral or almost energy positive is in a way a secondary step but it starts with no waste full circularity and in particular no unnecessary energy consumption i would say that is that is the key message regardless of the secondary design steps yeah. yeah and another key message i learned from you is repurposing drives design innovation which we For as sure. For parties sure. in the market, eh? you, you said the, the, the market must also respond and must respond quickly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, innovation ahead in that sense. Yeah. So you, you, you should be in a way, uh, let's say, enforced between brackets mm -hmm. to innovate. Uh, yeah. And the Gare Maritime is a very good example of that. That's why all the awards were in your <laughs> office, of course. <laughs> um, we have to conclude the debate. So I would like to thank, uh, we have to conclude it for the webinar, so I would like to thank our honored speakers. Uh, we can, well, we can still have a chat here, but we have to say goodbye to the people in their home office. Uh, not before uh, I um, promised you, I show you um, our next event, which will be in Eindhoven during Dutch Design Week and we, what will, uh, discuss hospitality also when it concerns waste, a very important uh, uh, issue when hotels have uh, uh, 
a good logistic organization and good uh, rooms for the well-being of their guests. Um, this is also an award-winning uh, project, by the way, from the BNA. Um, that's on the 19th of October, Tuesday. Please um, um, save the date in your, uh, and, and, and join us there. Uh, we will, of course, um, have all the guidelines, but we do have room for a number of vi VIPs. And we will also have a webinar. And then we will go to Maastricht on the 23rd of November. And we will have the University of Maastricht um, um, presenting uh, uh, in Tapijn, which is a former uh, caserne, um, which is now being used as an uh, educational building. We will have the Maastricht University presenting uh, their latest um, um, uh, the latest research on uh, um, a good, uh, good air quality uh, uh, for also office, uh, office people. Uh, we will have the architect of the building uh, show their plans. So please join us also here in November, probably hopefully with lots, mo lots of more people. Um, so um, subscribe for our newsletter, look at the LinkedIn page. This is uh, a screenshot of our YouTube channel where you can also look, have a look at the uh, other webinars we hosted this year and last year. And we want to thank you for joining us all. So, um, that concludes the webinar, and we hope to see you next time.